first of all, we should just be clear. We're talking primarily about Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when we think about this, this grand promise of the fulfillment of renewal, repopulation, refreshment, and blessing, sometimes there's the idea that in the new covenant, what is new, one thing that is new, is that God now focuses in terms of the individual as opposed to the corporate life of the nation of Israel. We see this principle coming through in Ezekiel 18, the soul who sins shall die. And sometimes that is positioned as um, the dominant note of the new covenant over against a kind of corporate dealing with the people of God. And I don't think Jeremiah 31 is saying that the new covenant is new in respect of God now dealing with individuals. And the reason I say that, and there's much more besides this to say, but the reason that I say that is because God promises here in chapter 31 that the new covenant will be made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Uh, Later in verse 33, he talks about uh, the covenant. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. Certainly the principle of individual responsibility is preserved. Uh, God does not punish anyone unjustly, but there's always an abiding corporate dimension as well. Of course, archetypally running back all the way to our identity in Adam Um, But there's always a corporate dimension and an individual dimension, and I think that comes through here as well. Jeremiah elsewhere will talk about the reunification of the houses of Judah and Israel, uh, a regathering of the people of God into one uh, house. And so um, the corporate abides, the individual responsibility abides. Okay, so if that's not new, what else is not new? Well... It's also not declaring a newness in the sense that the old covenant is completely done away with. Uh, The covenant isn't replaced, uh, the covenant that God made with Israel in the Old Testament. Obviously, again, this new covenant is made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Uh, It's picking up on all of the themes, as, as Will said, of the covenants of the Old Testament. Notice in Jeremiah 31, God says as one of the particular blessings of the new covenant that he will put his law within the hearts of his people. Ezekiel speaks of this in chapter 36 of God planting his own spirit in them, uh, giving his people a new spirit and a new heart. But here, Jeremiah speaks of the law, the law that was given by God uh, to the nation of Israel being written. So, The New Covenant doesn't destroy the Old Covenant law, but writes it on the heart. The New Covenant, third, uh, is not new in the sense that it brings about a new principle of communion with the Lord. Uh, It was always the principle of the Old Testament covenants that God would be God to his people and that they would be uh, his own. Um, Right away at the Exodus, uh, God declares, I'm taking you to be a people for my own possession. So as, as Will put it, this is the fulfillment of, of everything that's gone before being declared in the new covenant. And, um, and so at that point, we have to ask, well, what, what exactly is new? Mm-hmm. What is yeah. new? And, and, and Jeremiah, the Lord, lists a number of promises. Here's how I would categorize them. And I'm, I'm borrowing, just because it's fresh in my mind, a little bit from uh, Phil Riken's commentary on Jeremiah though I'm using some different language. Number one, uh, what is promised is a regathering. Whereas the Old Covenant uh, resulted in the division of Israel and Judah and the exile of the people of God to Babylon ultimately, the New Covenant will result in a regathering of the people of God. Number two, uh, regeneration. Uh, Whereas the Old Covenant law was, was written on tablets of stone, Uh, God promises that he's going to write his law on the hearts of his people. Calvin says this. He says, The new covenant penetrates into the heart and reforms all the inward faculties so that obedience is rendered to the righteousness of God. So regathering, regeneration. Third, um, reconciliation. I will be their God and they shall be my people. The new covenant is going to bring to pass definitively 
what was at the heart of all the Old Testament covenants. And then finally, and this is Reichen's word here, evangelization. Well, not finally, almost finally. Evangelization. Uh, the Old Covenant resulted in Israel's refusal to know the Lord. Uh, Jeremiah chastises the people for failing to know the Lord, for deceiving, uh, all the people are deceiving their brother. But now in the New Covenant, uh, the people of God will know him. They will know him in covenant communion. And how is this possible? How is all of this to be done to a wicked people who are in exile or heading for exile? Uh, the final blessing here in verse 34, uh, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So satisfaction for sin. Uh, whereas the old covenant resulted in exposing sin, the new covenant will address sin uh, once and for all. Now, no sooner do we, do, we, do we articulate textually what's new about the new covenant, this unprecedented regathering, effective regeneration, uh, realization of reconciliation, the evangelization of the people of God, and all because of the satisfaction for sin, then we have to recognize that, that many of these blessings, certainly not pervading the nation of the Old Testament, uh, the nation of Israel, but many of these blessings were present for the believing people in the Old Testament. And this, I think, is the point at which things get a little more complicated. Uh, because we can't act as though all of these new covenant blessings were wholly absent from the people of God uh, prior to the coming of Christ. We do believe that God was saving a people from him, for himself uh, from of old, from the time of the fall onward.